I'll be with you as soon as I get untangled. <laughs> well, this morning we have a rather important but controversial subject. I think nearly everyone remembers the idea of the ancients that money was not a commodity, but a convenience. Now, we got that point rather badly confused in recent centuries. Today, uh, we have lost sight of the origin of the financial system. Back in the primitive times, a man came to, martyr, to barter. He bartered what he had for what he wanted. If he had four sheep, he might get one camel, and everyone was happy. A little later, it was simplified. Paper receipts were passed about. It became a little inconvenient as civilization became more complicated to try to carry the collateral with you wherever you went. You wanted some way of arbitrating or shopping or exchanging various commodities. Out of this grew a very basic system in which uh, seals or inscriptions upon tablets became the basis of financial relationships. As early as the beginning of the Christian era, the Chinese had uh, a system of financing which was based upon the number of deer in the imperial uh, preserves. Uh, the money factor was printed or painted upon deer skin. And the whole con con uh, system was conserved in the person of the emperor. As time went on, all these things changed, and we came to the beginning of a more or less organized system of establishing values. We know, for instance, that in early Virginia, the prime rate of exchange was based upon tobacco. Tobacco was currency. Among some of the natives of the South Pacific, quarry shells were prime assets. Many of the Central European and Eastern European uh, peoples began to take an interest in salt. Salt was a currency in a number of different countries. Salary was wage paid in salt. Salvation was the saving power of salt. We find in the Bible that we, Christ refers to his disciples as the salt of the earth. Blocks of salt were gifts of imperial value for the kings of Abyssinia. All kinds of different devices were advanced to meet the need of exchanges. Today we are in a dilemma, and it's getting worse all the time. We look around us and we do not see how the present economic system can last to the beginning of the next century. It is getting more complicated every day and practically no common sense thoughtfulness is being directed toward it. We are trying to find out how people might live on another planet, but we are not able to make life endurable on this one. We are still constantly exploring and scientifically extending and expanding, and we are creating mo monopolies and masters over monopolies and still nothing is solved. We are in financial problems. The world, theoretically speaking, if you would put it on a computer, is simply bankrupt. We could never pay the debts. So we must now find some way of not handing on to the next generation a bill that nothing and no one can meet. There is always the possibility of pushing forward a little bad news, but the bad news is too powerful today to be endured. We cannot continue in this way. So we begin to think what we could do to meet some of these problems. And we realize that the whole system under which we live, the whole political, social, economic system, is all a matter of money. The entire system is sustained by money, and money today is debt. So we are in a bit of a jam, and something must be done to take care of it. The buying power of money is very largely limited to boundaries.
Some countries have what we call strong currencies and others weak currencies. We also know that money is under constant speculation. And we have forgotten one of the prime principles of ancient thought, and that is that money is not a commodity. Money is never the prime asset, although we have tried to make it this from the beginning of our national and world history. We have countries today where they can buy nothing with a dollar, practically. Other countries where dollars are strong, and this controls trade, and to a large measure controls internal peace. The more complicated the economic situations become, the more revolutions and anarchies set in. We're in a world now in which practically every nation is dissatisfied, frightened, and insolvent. All this calls for taking something besides a new regulation into the next century. If we want to get into the century in one piece and stay there and look forward to some kind of improvement, we must begin, therefore, by considering our monetary system. Now, I know there may be objections to this thinking, but I believe firmly that one of the first answers we have to consider is a world currency. We must have a dollar that is a dollar everywhere, from the Congo to the highest peaks of our economic system. Now, a dollar being a dollar everywhere requires certain basic considerations. In other words, the prime asset of a sound financial system is the population itself. Humanity is the prime asset in his own banking system. It is not what he has, but what he is that determines whether his system will endure. Therefore, it is not a question as to whether some nations are too poor for a standardized banking, or some are too rich to want it. The answer is very simple. The great asset is humanity. And therefore, this is the basis of all security in economics. That means that no matter how poor a country may be, there are others that are more wealthy. But it will even off so that it is possible to have a world currency. Now, certain changes have to be made to make this feasible. But the basis of it is that there is no longer any need for this continuous changing, exchanging of imports and imports, tariffs and all this type of thing. If we work upon the basis that what we are selling from buying is humanity. We are not simply buying cars and exporting engines. What we are doing are we are exporting labors of human beings and we are working with a unit of approximately six billion human beings and they are the prime asset of the world and when we start to make this prime asset unendurable or incapable of surviving then we are doing the same thing to the world that comes with an economic panic on wall street so we think in terms now of a single system of money a money that is universally distributed. But we will not necessarily mean that this is the end of the banking system. It only means that we're going to have to turn to a world bank. Now a world bank has some advantages, but if it is carried on with too much political interference, it would become a, a disaster. But a world bank should be the power that handles the prime asset the integrity and uh, probabilities of profit for the whole human race. Now this could be an entirely new setup, or it could be simply a transferring of machinery. All the little banks all over the world could stay, but they would stay as part of a bank of a world bank system. It would be it would be based upon the concept that wherever you go, as the English used to say, a pound's a pound the world around. There would be no more conflicting or disparaging of various currencies. There would be always this one total supply. If all the wealth of the world was under proper control, there could never be poverty. Poverty is unbalanced. 
poverty is somebody working for too little and someone else making too much. There is no reason why, on a financial basis, humanity cannot be self-supporting. It can become capable of handling its own future without interference from outside forces. Irregularities of management are one of the causes of disaster. Now, the word idea of a World Bank can be regarded as the basis of something else that is very, very necessary to make it a success. And that is the abolishment of one of our favorite industrial principles. As uh, I believe it was Ben Franklin observed, Brother Wiley, that there's always trouble when we borrow and lend. Therefore, the idea of money to make money has gotten, has gotten us into this predicament. We do not want to work. We want our money to work for us. But we are living organisms, and our money isn't. Our money is simply something we have accumulated, saved up, or hoarded, in order not to participate in the world's emergencies. If the emergencies are removed, then the necessity for this type of uh, business mismanagement no longer exists. In other words, money cannot make money because it has no place to get it from except itself. And this is the beginning of something that is even more difficult to study and analyze than the curve of the cosmic comminium. There is no way it can be done. So we have a new idea in the form of a banking system which neither loans nor borrows. Because it neither loans nor borrows, it cannot be manipulated. Another point that is very important is that the world banking system should not be under the political control of any nation. The moment the nation has rights to control the banking system, the manipulation of funds is inevitable. Therefore, the nation, like the individual, would be required to depend upon the World Bank to do its banking. And when the nations or countries or states or individuals need funds, they can secure them. But they secure them from something that they cannot actually personally control. And this means a very important problem to be faced. The integrity of this system. A World Bank must be completely free from political compromise. It cannot be a place to hide unpleasant uh, funds. It cannot be manipulated by any political party. It cannot be expended for any political purpose. And it cannot be used for, the, for any purpose other than that which the people or the government wish to use it for. But it must pass through a neutral agent so that the various countries, like a great corporation, with modern computerization, this is easy. We will know why every country borrows everything that it needs, what it spends it for, and when it pays off. This would put, more or less, humanity on a business basis, free from the domination of private interests. Private interests can use the World Bank, just as anyone else, but they must admit why they use it, what they use it for, and how they're going to return it. These things would change the entire face of our financial world and would actually do no one any harm. It is simply a case where we have to begin to think in terms of survival rather than trying to patch up a hopeless situation. One of the great causes for debt is uh, the making of money from money. It's a case where the interest gradually eats up the principal and so nothing is left. We are now paying mortgage money and debt money for billions and billions of dollars that can never be replaced. This was not a reasonable situation. So we'll consider for a moment the possibility of a world bank with a world currency. All nations would use the same uh, common symbols, would use the same currency, 
and puts more money the same change. But it would all be geared and told and cycled and indemnified by the World Bank. It would be a World Bank note, not an American bank note or an English pound. It would be a World Bank note, equally circulated and equally acceptable on, in every country on earth. This would end the exploitation of money. And having this type of money to work with, we kind of find how, to do, how we use it. Supposing we say, well, everybody would borrow, but nobody would pay. But that is not quite right, because anyone who borrows would find it inevitable that he would have to pay. Supposing he borrowed a thousand dollars because he wanted to spend a weekend in Las Vegas. Now, this is a serious business problem involving great depths of integrity. So he borrows it. And there it is. But he's paying for it with the currency of the World Bank. He gets up there and he pays $200 a day for his room. This $200 a day he pays for in World Bank currency. And the hotel, in turn, uh, takes this money and deposits it in its business account in the World Bank. And in the course of the time, the inflow and outgo would continue and nobody would be broke. It would definitely mean that everything that you take out would ultimately go back. And without interest or without usury or without any problem of this kind, all you take out, all would go back. And at the end of any given length of time, theoretically, the uh, World Bank would have exactly the same capital. This in end also would begin to create a certain censorship which we desperately need. We do not know where our money goes. We do not know what we spend it for or how important things are. But we cannot go into bankruptcy from extravagance if every bill that we pay for our extravagance goes back to the same bank. We have a system in which while we may take it out in one piece, it will go back in several pieces as we spend it, but it will all have to go back. There is no mortgage, no usury. There is nothing that can prevent 100% of what we take out ultimately going back 100%. And if there is no detouring for private interests, we can keep a World Bank going indefinitely, far into the future of things. And it will increase with the population of the world, for it is a living total institution for a living total world and not a series of private institutions trying to run each other into bankruptcy. The bankruptcies of various forms of business that we know at the present time are very largely a matter of chicanery in relationship uh, to financial affairs. We know beyond any question of doubt that many contracts are given for all kinds of national defense and national uh, insurance. And they are all padded. Everything is more than it ought to be. Everyone is concerned only in profit because profit creates leisure for someone or wealth for someone at the expense of the rest. There is no way of handling this unless the very process itself is broken. Otherwise, we will be able to elect even the most honest person and in a short time, they will be picked up in this miasma that we call capitalism. Now, capitalism isn't bad. There's nothing wrong about it. The only thing is, capitalism is a dream for all humanity and not for a minority group. Capitalism is equality, it is democracy. Capitalism is the right of everyone to what they need, and democracy is the proper government by which they can attain it. Therefore, there is no conflict here. The only conflict is that the World Bank is the final capitalist and it is administering the wealth of the world to the world for the good of the world. If it is at any time trotted off into the keeping of any private group, the same problems we've always had will come back. It has to be a complete system in itself. 
we have something a little bit close to it in the postal system of the world, which now recognizes the postage stamps of other nations and all together forms a postal union in which each country agrees to handle the mail of all other countries. Now, the postal union could be a little example of the need of a great banking union, a union of the distribution of the world's funds. It could be well provided for catastrophes and matters of this kind. We wouldn't be, have to be required to continually raise funds for disasters and catastrophes. It would be that all we have is available to all of us all of the time. And this does not mean that we will be very rich or have a, a, a complete control of money, but it means that we will be free from the burden of fear, burden of unemployment, and burden of political dishonesty. We will find that all branches will become more honest when the medium they handle is honest and those handling it are honest. Therefore, it seems very important that a World Bank never come under the proprietorship of any nation or any group of nations. It must be available from all to all. Now, if you carry, carefully consider this, you'll realize that the Chinese had somewhat of this idea in their system of agriculture. The Chinese, for Taoists particularly, used water as a universal symbol of life. So we can say for a moment that water and wealth, or water and the financial structure, have something in common. It is water that makes the fields green. It is water that carries uh, the merchandise down the rivers to the sea. And all of these things are part of a universal natural process. The water flow is continuous. But according to some experts at least, there is never actually more or less water in the world. It is variously distributed in all kinds of ways. It exists in three primary forms, in the forms of a gas or atmospheric sustaining, a liquid and a solid if it is frozen. So water becomes a symbol of available to all peoples of the earth. And it begins in the mountain. It goes down the sides of the mountain and flows into the stream. And along the sides of the stream, the natives build their villages. The streams finally converge to form a river, and on the river there are boats, and there are larger communities, and the rivers fall into the sea, and the sea becomes the basis of fishing and navigation. And after it reaches the sea, the sun shines on it, and the sun raises the water again, and turns it into a vapor or a mist, and drops it back on the mountain, and the whole cycle begins again. There is never any interruption. It may be clear here and rainy there, but on the face of the earth, this endless cycle goes on. And this was the idea of the Chinese concept of what was good for all, was that which was available to all. And this was in perfect accordance with universal nature and the plan of things. So if we are watchful with this problem and can do something to stimulate proper attention, we can end forever most of the problems that arise from wealth. The primary problem, of course, is poverty. The secondary problem is crime. The third problem is sickness and death. These things are all affected to some degree by the instability of the economic system. Health is damaged by the exorbitant cost of medical skill. Medical skill is the result of small groups or small nations or even large nations individually handling their health problem. We've reached a case now where anything that is of important to mankind must be handled collectively. We can no longer have all kinds of separate ways of trying to solve one problem. There is only one possible solution, and that is common sense. And until we get, come to that, there is no answer. We can never prop up the present system into the next future with any security. We are going to ultimately be definitely damaged and perhaps run into the final bankruptcy, which we do not want. And it is very difficult to realize 
that this bankruptcy is due to wealth and not to poverty. The bankruptcy is due, due to the fact that we mistake the structure of nature. Nature moves collectively. The old uh, planet we live on lives and develops and survives for the good of everything upon it. Whereas man, being a small fraction of what is on it, spends most of his time trying to destroy the rest of it. He destroys natural resources, he wastes them. He does everything possible to make something for himself and leave nothing for the future. He doesn't realize this, but he is doing it every single day. We are simply pushing off the bad news so that our children and their children must carry the weight of it. This will not work. It cannot succeed. It will lead from one tyranny to another. Tyranny is mostly due to the centralization of power. That is the opposite of what we term democracy. And the ultimate form of democracy is that the world is one unit with every uh, nation and every individual in that unit part of one great system. And that great system is basically economic because economics governs employment, it provides raw materials, it does everything that we need, it is the basis of pension plans and all this, but with the proper structure there is no need for a pension plan because from beginning to end the monetary system exists for the purpose of maintaining a normal flow of wealth or money to every family on earth. It has to be this way. We have to divide the means by the number of ends we expect to serve. And we do this, it would be amazingly simple. We would no longer have dictators going off with a hundred million or something of that kind. We would no longer have these vast contracts that we don't understand because these things would be all subject to the actual flow of world resource and would be completely out of the hands of political groups. This can never work if a political group can control the wealth. It can only be true where the world's necessities, values, and commodities control all classes and are served equally by all individuals. Even now, with the late start, it would be quite possible to make some steps in this direction, steps that would get us away from the continual fear, danger, and anxiety about tomorrow. We are tired of the ups and downs of the stock exchange. The stock exchange is no answer to anything. It will make, be, make one man a millionaire today and a pauper tomorrow. There is no security here. And there is constant finagling, constant ulterior motives. And one thing that a different, truly proper system would be to help to advance virtue by not rewarding vice. We, do not, we should not in, in, employ and reward individuals for their dishonesty. We should not allow the making of money to conceal the lack of integrity. Now we can say that the whole situation rests on integrity. No system without integrity can survive. But one of the best ways to improve integrity is to lower the probabilities of lack of integrity. If we make dishonesty less profitable, we will automatically have more integrity. And this in turn will gradually reveal the values and the securities and the well-being that integrity alone can make possible. The idea of integrity at the base of civilization is the only hope any civilization has of survival. And world integrity is the guarantee of our world and survival and going forward into the next century with some hope of peace and integrity. These things should be taught in school. The school child should be taught that poverty is not necessarily our heritage. Poverty does not mean that in spite of anything we can think of and anything we can do, the poor will be with us always. 
Actually, poverty now, with six billion people, as creating produce of one kind or another, scattered over nations which are gradually becoming literate, raising their standards of culture and education, there is no reason why the gross product of the earth should not sustain mankind with dignity. Now this dignity is something most people are a little bit afraid of. There is not too much love of dignity in this world. Most everyone wants what they want right now regardless of what it costs. But they do not remember so well what it cost them when they lost everything they had. The problem is that any system of ethics must be gradually supported by the cooperation of those who it serves. Without this cooperation, nothing is possible. That is why nature, in its infinite wisdom, does not bring a reform until the present condition is intolerable. We won't change until we have to. It's just like the individual on a narcotic. You can give them all the cheer they want, but a great many of them prefer to remain narcotics until the end and have one great big high before they die. Well, the world at this moment is much in that condition. We're on the verge of a big high before we die. Nations, countries, districts, cities, families are all sick. They are all in problemed by situations which they cannot solve. So the only thing that seems reasonable is to have one great big flash before it all ends. Unfortunately, nature doesn't see it that way. Nature is not going to let us destroy ourselves, but it is going to force us to correct our ways. It is going to force us to realize that we are one family and that there is a lot of work to be done right here before we devote too much time and energy to outer space. We've got too much that needs to be done here. The unsolvable problem is relationships in the levels of humanity. These are the things that have to be solved. In order to solve these problems, we either have to arbitrate them through intelligence or fight them off with rebellions and all kinds of atrocities. We have to solve things by making them honest. We have here on this planet all that we need for security, but it is not available to us. It is mortgaged, it is owned by somebody else, it is part of a great cartel, or it is under political influence that is adverse to the public good. So we have to recognize the need of setting up the skeleton framework of one world concept. Our communications tie us together. We re listen to the same programs on television. Various trades are being interchanged. We are making things for people all over the world and they're making them for us. We are in business everywhere. But too much of our business is monkey business. And until we clear this up, we are not going to have the securities that we need. There is absolutely no need for mortgaging of anything. There is no possible reason to borrow or lend. Because everything that we can borrow, we can borrow only, actually, from the human wealth. And the only thing we can pay off is with that human wealth. And if we set it up properly, we are now stepping into the next stage, next stage of world affairs. We know today that there are United Nations movements. There are various groups trying to bring together people to a better understanding. But most of these uh, better movements are limited and restricted by the financial equation. They're, even the countries they represent are not willing to make any sacrifice for the common good or very little sacrifice. All these things have to be taken and put into a new pattern. One world, one family, one source of labor, one work, and one reward for labor. Labor can be anything from digging a ditch to, to uh, studying through telescopes or in laboratories. It can be in business, the sciences, the philosophies, or the religions. But in any case, wherever it is, it must be part of a one world structure. This be, must be no longer any barriers. In religion, this means religious tolerance, absolutely. It means that everyone is recognized 
as part of a religious world and we pick out of religion everything that is necessary for the moral growth, ethical standing and integrity of the human being. And under whatever name it comes, we rec recognize it and respect it and support it. The proper control of wealth could be the greatest moralizing agent that we know because money is so important to most people that the control of it, the direction of it, and the proper use of it is a new educational pattern that should be begun and, and augmented in the public school system. We should know definitely that children growing up understand why a new and complete reform of all economic policy is absolutely essential to the survival of mankind. Lacking this and continuing in our present course, of hating each other, fighting each other, we will finally be all victims of some form of atomic disaster or simply starve from the complete destruction of our natural resources. Waste is, is failure to recognize. We, we do not think now much about how other people use what they have as long as we do what we want to with what we have. But if it finally becomes obvious that what everybody wants to do is important to everybody else, and that any misuse of values damages not the person that it was intended to damage, but the whole of civilization. We are coming to the point where we are one people and we have to be. This means education should be pointed in this direction. We should learn along with reading, writing, and arithmetic the importance of the one world process. We see it coming. We see one nation after another fighting for liberty and falling into slavery. All these little countries now are trying to be separate again. But in being separate, they take upon themselves all the burdens of a major power. The little separate nation is struggling desperately to survive financially. It has to borrow money. It has to mortgage its own future. It has to do all kinds of things in order that its little country, which is not much larger than somebody's backyard, contains a true and completely autonomous re regime. The, the, with money, they get a little richer than the dictators move in and take the money and leave the country. It is all verging toward this problem that the abuse of wealth is a form of suicide which the country has to face. We cannot continue the present course of action without desperate uh, consequences. So we must begin, perhaps even in our own families, to recognize that, in, that cooperation is the only source of strength and that cooperation is best advanced when it establishes a pattern which others can follow and build and work with. There is no reason at all why we should ever have to have old age pensions or we should have to have social security or we should have to have insurance of any kind. If each individual is backed by the rest of six billion people there's no possible way in which he can fail to have what he needs. Because actually, no matter how much he gets, no matter how much he takes from this bank, the World Bank, at the end of a hundred years, there is exactly to the dime in that bank what there was when it started. Because no matter what he does with the money, it goes back into that bank indirectly. In the meantime, he gets the hospital work that he needs. Or he gets the dentistry that he requires. But the dentist then deposits the money. But little by little, everything comes back. There is in this concept something against the feeling that we have that monetary systems are temporary. We go judge them by paper notes or silver currency. And after many, many years of desperate striving, a small committee got it uh, possible to put in God request on the paper money. It's not, not only do we do not trust in God, because if we really trusted in God, we would do those things which have been advocated and endorsed by the great religious teachers of all time, namely that the ultimate end of all things is the brotherhood of all that lives. Now, there's no brotherhood in competition. There is no brotherhood in exploitation. There is no uh, advance in civilization by hoarding up something that must then be taken by disaster or conquest. The end of conquest comes 
if the average dictator was not able to look forward to taking over the prime assets of a nation, he would soon be in some other line of business. It is not any use to anyone to do what we do today if we cannot have more than our share of the, of the realities of life. Now this does not mean that we put a top on incomes. That has been one answer that has been advocated but has had very little uh, support. We don't need to do that. The tax upon incomes is unimportant, really. If we remove interest on, on mortgages and a few of these fancy trimmings, there is absolutely no need for any limitation upon not reasonable income. It is the fact that this income is exploited. The whole theory is exploited that we get into trouble. If a man makes a million dollars and somebody gets half of it for building him a home, that half goes back to the World Bank. The plumber and the paper hanger and the garage man takes another piece of it. And in the course of a reasonable length of time, everything that was given to that man out of the World Bank is equated by a similar uh, deposit in that bank. All the people the original borrower bought for have in turn been paid and their payments go back into the bank. And it goes back time and time again. There is no loss. There is no way in which anybody can borrow the bank out in, into bankruptcy. There is no one can run that bank or force its closure. It has no stockholders. It has nothing of this nature. It is a simple and direct manner by which we can serve the population of the world by organizing the good which the world has to offer, the beauties, the ideals, the principles, the educational factors. It inspires invention and does all these things, and most of all, it gives the individual the sense that he cannot go broke. He cannot go broke for a very simple reason. He never had anything. He can't lose it because the complete world pattern, his world, has it. And that world makes it available to him when he needs it. But there is no reason in the world why the individual should have a home foreclosed on him. There is no reason why he should lose his job. Hey, Jim, wake up. There is no reason why a new invention should put tens of thousands out of work. Yeah, I'm on my way. There is no reason why or any particular thought in connection with these problems that is sensible or uh, real. We are in a world where we can be safe, but we cannot be safe and utterly selfish. Selfishness is one of the problems that we have. We look over the human character and we compare this character with the admonitions of scripture, for example. And we can use either this religion or any other major religion. And we will find that our living is inconsistent with the, the religions which we claim to believe and the denominations which we belong to. We are reading about them, but we are continuing to leave uncorrected the selfishness and um, self-centeredness uh, within our own natures. The only way we can really overcome this is to see a plan big enough to challenge us. We can see a plan in which it's no longer necessary for us to have an army because the financing of an army is no longer the privilege of one country. The only way uh, a, a financing system on the World Bank could finance an army is if it should finance every army on earth at the same time or make army the primary investment. And if we had all our earth money in the form of weapons and every one of our countries was producing these weapons for defense, who would we fight? We'd have to go out and find another planet to use it on because our own structure which has destroyed, if it is properly maintained, has destroyed all need for armament. There's no, we no longer are going to have two countries fighting each other because both will have to be financed for the same bank. And that's going to be hard to consider. And it also will have a very marginal, well, large effect upon taxation of all kinds. The proper management of human affairs 
would give us a quiet world in which to live, a world in which most of the folks would be doing what they most desire to do and not be the victims and uh, uh, pawns in the hands of a vast political and economic um, mercenary system. We can have what we need, we can have it, and when we get sick, we can call on it, because the whole complete system can come to the aid of one person. Whereas now, there's no such a possibility. So I think that the uh, coming century is going to force some of this thinking upon our people. We're going to have to face the impossibility of the present situation. We cannot continue to exploit the natural resources. Traffic situation alone are becoming impossible. We are exhausting the basic resources that took nature millions of years to build up. We are on a little planet where we are completely isolated in space like shipwrecked mariners. We have nowhere to go but where we are. And any so-called discussion of where we might be going remains extremely vague. The fact of the matter is, we don't need to go anywhere. But the power that brought this planet into existence set up a system in which this planet could survive indefinitely. It could go on for thousands and millions of years without wasting the resources which were built up. We're becoming more impressed with the importance of conservation because of population expansion. But population expansion also produces more assets for the World Bank. When it reaches 9 billion population, this will not shake the bank at all. But it will shake practically any private economic institution that man can build. We are not prepared or equipped to handle overpopulation. But overpopulation is no problem if the values of life are pooled constantly so that there is never a monopoly and never a need for a war or a revolution in order to get a square meal. So we also can go a little bit into the philosophy of this problem and see how it fits definitely into the great dream of the ages, the dream of the golden age which we gradually changed into an age of gold and have regretted it ever since. <laughs> we can re look forward to perhaps a new heaven and a new earth right here. We can look forward to a world in which we are not afraid of each other. We are looking forward to a world in which crime simply doesn't pay at all, doesn't even produce any satisfaction. We are here where all forms of vice that actually become what they were destroyers of the peace, destroyers of happiness, and destroyers of the individual, but not of the collective. Any abuse of our world position will come on back upon our heads. Now, somewhere in the world here also, we have the law of cause and effect, and the laws of compensation. We have the probability that to have a secure future, we must earn it. We are not going to have it handed to us. If we wish to be better off than we are, we must be better than we are. All of this problem we're going through is a kind of testing to see what the human being will do in various situations. And most folks have flunked the test so far. They have continued to hope for the best and done nothing. They have done all they could in little things, but nothing to correct the major problems we face. And for now and for a long time to come, finance will be the big temptation, the big problem, and the cause of the big emergency. Unless we can solve that, none of the other things we try to do will accomplish much that is of permanent value. We have to solve this problem. We have to find out how we can keep six million people on this earth without any of them being hungry. We cannot take the viewpoint of certain militarists that we'd be better off if a few hundred million starve to death or get murdered off. This is not nature's answer to anything. It is not human answer, but in desperation we destroy ourselves and each other. 
The answer is a puzzle, maybe, a game, a challenge, something about which the greatest scientists that we know might have something to think about. Here we have a problem that's suitable to challenge our greatest thinkers, our greatest scientists, mathematicians, economists, everything you could think of. The challenge of making humanity a practical form of existence in the world we live in. We have all the resources that we haven't already wasted, but they are getting somewhat thinner. We know that we are continually building for further difficulties. We know that uh, we are polluting the atmosphere, polluting the earth, and polluting the water. That we are doing everything possible to destroy ourselves. And here we sit back with great problem, great delight, and so forth, to try and find out whether we can make a medical transplant of one human head onto another body. What we really need to do is to do something with the heads that are on the bodies now <laughs> and get them into condition to be something in a living world of problems. It is no longer necessary to calculate what is going to happen in space because we may not last long enough for it to happen anyway if we do not change our ways now. And when I say now, I mean within the full measure of this coming century. It will take probably most of that time to do it. Uh, Moore in his Utopia, which was one of the most uh, uh, ancient and interesting of the utopian dreams. Moore's Utopia was a sizable country, approximately the size of France. It was also populated by a group of people who were very intelligent, very helpful, useful, and uh, good-natured. The, uh, the entire country, the uh, Moore's Utopia, had no medium of exchange. There was no monetary system in Utopia. But if a Utopian wished to go out into this sad, cold world of high finance, the country issued him money to take care of his trip and said they never expected to see it again. Also, for, for value, uh, they used only primarily the word of a man or woman. A person's word was absolute. If he said he would do it, he did it. No bonds, no mortgages, nothing. He would do what he said he would do in exactly the way he promised to do it. And as for gold, which has become so important to us, he thought it would be in, in Utopia, it made a very attractive cover for plumbing. Nobody wanted gold. No one thought that gold was any more secure than anything else. Well, today we have a system in which gold is the most secure thing we have. But there is something more secure than gold, and that is human integrity. Until we have that, we can't even take care of the gold. But while we are telling how strong and superior and wonderful it is, the thieves have broken in and stolen half of it. We cannot do with anything without improving the basic values of life through a proper cooperation of effort on levels of high finance, high economics, high computerization, and all the things we're working with at the present time. We have computers, but without morality they will add simply more to our load of sorrow. We had the motion picture, which was going to do great things. We're still waiting for the great things, but most that we're getting is ads, which are becoming more numerous all the time. We looked to all things. Higher education was going to do it. The great telescope was going to reveal all. And here we are, troubled to the very extent that many, many people see no hope for the future. We have no actual consecration. Education must be turned to use. No person is educated who does not know that cooperation is more important than competition. No one is educated who does not put the common good above his own personal desires. And there is no one educated who is not ready to stand up and defend integrity wherever it exists. These things we are not doing anything about. Our schools won't permit the discussion of morality even. Our various lines of business consider all integrities a debit and a source of financial loss. But what they don't tell us is that finance is losing itself. 
the whole financial theory is proving its own lack of value. We are constantly trying to trade ourselves in and out of some other country. We're trying to build up gross profit. We're trying to t get some other country to take something we don't want while we take something they do want. This is all the same. Every day the same news. Another big cartel is being sued by the government. There is no end to this. And here we are, presumably, the most progressive the most enlightened, the most fortunate uh, group of human beings that ever inhabited the earth. We have come through many, many beginnings in order to reach this high degree of what? A kind of economic cannibalism. A constant process of devouring each other's hopes, beliefs, dreams, and ideals. So we have to do something to get into that 21st century. And one of the things we have to do is get in there in a group. We've got to go in as a civilization dedicated to progress and not to profit. Or rather, perhaps realizing that progress is the only profit that is real. We can do this a little bit, at least, by gradually becoming accustomed to the idea of sharing rather than grabbing. We can also gain some consolation out of watching other people have a good time and not being jealous of them all the while. Any today, anyone who is happy is a victim of jealousy, regarded as either uh, a thief in disguise or a, a dim-witted person. We cannot even accept the idea that anyone can find happiness or growth. Yet by degrees we are developing a new kind of people. They're showing up here and they're showing up there, but they are people who are beginning to realize where the trouble really is. That now is the time when we must get ready for a major change. That we cannot go on much longer making identically the same mistakes as our ancestors. We are no better off morally and ethically than the Phoenicians were three or four thousand years ago. They took good care of their friends, hated their enemies, uh, and killed strangers. And we do the same thing. We do not have any understanding of what three or four thousand years of civilization has done. Now we have a few, in that course of time, we had a few civilized people. We had a few people who saw the truth and realized what it meant. So we did one of two things. We either exterminated them or forgot them. They were right, but we weren't ready to be told that they were right, or we were not ready to accept what is right. So we disposed of them as a simple solution. We're trying it now. The moment anyone raises a voice that is different from the particular pressures of the moment, we do all that we can to silence them. But today, they're not all remaining silent. There is coming all around the world a recognition of the absolute need of putting a new morality into function, a morality based upon the service of each other, of kindly, friendly, and cooperative dealings. We are gradually realizing that friendship is better than animosity and cooperation better than competition. As these processes increase, groups will arise standing for these principles. As they get stronger, they will have a greater say. At the same time, those who are functioning from the wrong foundation are having more and more trouble. Each day we discover some more vice and someone we thought was a great hero. But to each day we find that leaders are less able to lead and that people who might be good leaders are less willing to run for office because it is nothing short of ethical suicide. So we hear now two world wars, one great depression, a great epidemic, a new epidemic not so big but building up, a series of vital seismic disasters. We've had the 20th century full of troubles. We've had a century of great expansion, which we will hear about as long as people can talk about it. We are told that we never had it so good. Uh, there is a little problem in what the little atomic book that has come out called Murphy's Law. 
And uh, one of the statements in Murphy's Law is that the optimist says this is the best time we will ever know. And the pessimist says he's probably right. <laughs> and this, uh, this is more or less our difficulty. Uh, we are unwilling to face the fact of growth. We are not mature human beings. The prime example of the creative process. We are not masters of all we survey. We say we may survey it, but it is taken away from us by taxes and mortgages. We are not really mature. We cannot keep a home together anymore. Everything we try to do it falls apart and if you examine it carefully enough there's a little bit of money involved in almost every disaster so to get the thing started right we've got to correct that and the only way that we can correct the money problem is to take it out of the keeping of professional economists and placing it in a neutral position where something like the United Nations but on a little less potentious uh, putting, we all contribute to one solid banking system by persons who are not in any public office nor representing anyone in public office. They should be trained in, in, for this position in school, college, and university. It should be the process of measuring and, under, and understanding the relationship between the human need and the human resource. And when they do this, they're going to find that the need is sufficient and the resource is sufficient. That we have no real problem unless the pattern is mismanaged. There is no reason why everyone should not have enough to eat unless a few people were too selfish. There is no reason why nations should go to each other's throats because of the financial advantage to politicians. All of this problem rests upon the fact that there is only one answer to our problem, and that is we must find a way of creating an honest dollar. The first paper money in China was done during the Ming dynasties. It was a piece of paper, a felt-like paper, about the size of an eight and a half, eleven typewriter sheet. On the front was a string of cash, little coins with strung on strings, the small change of China, and the number of cash indicated in the picture were represented by one denomination on the bill. The note was carried the seal of the emperor, and on the reverse there was a cute little inscription to the effect that anyone forging or counterfeiting this particular note would be shortened by the length of one head. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this, these notes have been found in the tombs of the Chinese nobles when they died so that they could be of use to them in the afterworld. Now, if we had a currency that we could take with us, this might possibly give us a special inducement to try to save something. But when these Chinese gentry died and went to the other world, their cash stayed here and uh, was excavated and a, bit, a piece of paper, the bit note, which was originally worth maybe 50 cents, is now worth several hundred dollars as a collector's item. In other words, it sort of made something on the interest rate. <laughs> but there is no way of taking that money with them. And uh, the whole theory is co so t totally physical, materialistic. Now, if we could prove that anybody no matter how rich they are, got out of this world very differently from anybody else, or took with him anything except his own conscience, we might have more incentive to making these constant mistakes. We are now finding fewer families are even willing to leave their funds to their own children, because it is obvious that these children are worthless. <laughs> this was uh, becoming a great problem. They are only... The individual who leaves a hundred million to his children will probably create only four or five more narcotics addicts because they'll have plenty of money to buy drugs with. It's, it doesn't work at all. The only thing that can work is integrity. It has to start by being true, by being right. 
And the only way is have handling money is so arrange it that thieves cannot get hold of it or cannot exploit it or cannot loan it to each other for 20% interest. All of this uh, high finance is the result of uh, money being under the control of government or as a phase of the national governing factor. The uh, government has the right to demonetize or increase the money to management of money. It creates a secretary for that purpose. But the money is controlled by the political processes of the government. Another government alongside has a different political structure, so their money is controlled in a different way. Actually, the only answer is this system, which is a sort of a grand exaggeration of credit cards, but with a certain amount of control, and in which the individual has one bank, all individuals. This bank has branches wherever you need them. All the banks we have now could well function as branches. But the funds are all in control of a non-political body that is pre created out of the population of nations for the purpose of administering honestly and neutrally the financial resources of the planet. If such a person misplaces his confidence or misuses his licenses and privileges, he should be the most seriously punished of all uh, malefactors. For an individual who damages the reputation or tries to cheat the World Bank is actually guilty of a crime against 16, 6 billion separate persons, all of whom are the victims of his desire to be dishonest. If we can get something working in this way, that has principles working for it, we will have a different picture by the time the century starts. And we will probably have opportunity, as days go on, to see more and more proof of why this is necessary. We are now trying to find what to do with our sewerage. We are trying to find how to get something to take the place of our petroleum. We are out for everything to balance the debits and credits of national trade balances. All these things are fussing. They are little things that should never exist. We should never have to go through all this process in order to survive. We should never go through all these compromises in order to succeed. They represent a tremendous straw figure that has been built up uh, through the ages and has been rather considered a god of wealth, a god of evil that wealth has become a thing of ill. It is not because of it being an asset that it is evil. It is because it is not honestly and properly administered. If we do have a process by which computerization can prove what happens to money, can prove who gets it and how it gets back, and we can prove in a hundred years from now that maybe 50 billion the accounts have been made to, upon this resource. People have borrowed it for everything you can think of. They have borrowed it for mortgages. They've borrowed it to educate their children. They've borrowed it for a weekend vacation. They've borrowed it for clothes or for food or for cars. Anything you want. They may have even borrowed it to take it over to Reno and lose it. But it'll all be down. Yet at the end of this great length of time, the, the flow is such that the uh, World Bank will be exactly the same in size and have just as much on hand as in the beginning. There will be no loss because of the stupidity of any individual. Because no matter what he does, what he does with the money, it will go back into that bank. If he loses it at Las Vegas or Reno, it will still go back to that bank. Whatever he buys with it, he has to pay for. And the person he pays will in turn have to deposit it or spend it again. And slowly it will work back to the World Bank. This would be a complete conservation and would leave at the end no world debt. The way we're going now, if there wasn't some control on it, 
Well, in the next hundred years, we'd owe so much we couldn't even dream of paying the interest on it. But if you have a world currency, a world structure, by means of which there is no longer any malefficiency, there is no malfiescence in the relationships of business, there is no subterfuge, no dictator goes off with 50 million, all these things cease because there's no need for them and no reason for them. There is no profit in them to the individual who is now dishonest. So one of our problems we have to face is to make honesty more profitable than dishonesty. And we can do it. We can not only make it more profitable, but infinitely more popular. And we will have a little time in between all these exchanges and interchanges to sit down and be friends with people. We will know each other better. We will not be afraid of each other. We won't spend half our time raising funds for some cause or other or trying to get together a group of people to get rid of some councilman or something of that thing. All this type of thing is tied to money. It is tied to some way of making a little more out of a bad situation. We've just about reached the end. Just one more major upheaval and we will be in very, very serious trouble. And we will always be in trouble as long as each nation creates its own currency. We will be in trouble just as they were in Germany and Hungary and Austria. After World War II, it cost as much as 25 billion pingos to mail a letter. The inflation was so bad that everyone was wiped out. And the people who were wiped out weren't the ones who were obviously responsible. But if there had been a different type of control in the first place, there'd have been no war. And if there'd been a national emergency requiring a great expenditure of funds, it would be, it would be available. And in less than 10 years, would be completely paid back without anyone owing a nickel. There is a way of doing it. And uh, we don't know just when it will be used, but it will have to be used only, probably, when things get just so bad you can't do anything else. But when it gets that bad, don't worry. It may hurt a little, probably hurt all of us, but don't worry. The worse it gets, the sooner we'll cure it. And going on as we go now, we're not in a great hurry to cure anything. But we are trying to put a patch on it in order to continue our own ways. We're still looking for the high interest rates. We're still looking for mortgages. We're still raising the price of utilities. We're also high pricing goods all every day. So we keep on until the cost and the income uh, reach equal height and there's nothing left. Then we will begin to try to solve some kind of a problem. But there'd be a happy way of doing it. But we can start by putting maybe a little t emphasis in our school systems on the fact that honesty is going to be necessary in the 21st century and that the young people who are going to that new century without an ideal are going to just carry on the miseries of this one and continue to make the miseries worse. We can start with young people and try to give them a better uh, foundation upon which to build. We can work with older people by trying to help them to understand the proper use of funds by which it would never be necessary for them to be dependent upon anyone. We can work all these things up to the proof that the working man will bring home his proper check, the child will have enough money for his education at all times without crippling their family, the wife wants to go out and take a job, she'll be paid, there'll be no loss, and there'll be no vast and heavy taxation to pay for all the things that we demand because we will create them ourselves. We will use our own means and because money does not get taxed or does not have to be split with political structures, we will not have near the taxation problem we have at the present time. Every individual can have a good life. And having a good life, there's something else to think about. Maybe, maybe when that happens, we'll settle down to the labors of peace art, music, religion, philosophy, all the beauties of nature, 
the exploration of the beauties and joys of life, all these things will be much easier because we can begin to learn the very truth of it. Namely, that the lily of the field neither sows nor reaps, but the, sky, the palace of Solomon is not as beautiful. So that out of studying nature we will find the great and beautiful things of life. We will find the realities we have no time for. And we will get over the idea that the world is corrupt or disloyal or unpleasant. We will be able to grow as human beings. And we can take this garden that we have inherited, which is full of weeds, and weed it. And we can make it a very beautiful garden in which we can live. We can live without fear. We can live without hating people because they have abused us and we can ha live without the fear of war hanging over our heads all the time. The main problem is to get a solid financial system that cannot be easily exploited and make it a world system and even the littlest country has a right to proudly belong to it. And then all will go out to a nice trip. You take the same wallet with you wherever you go. And the good you buy will be the same price in every nation. And that price will be fixed by values of a banking system faced and based upon productive. Productivity of peoples. That as the productivity of peoples increases, the resources of this bank increases, and this increased resource takes care of population increase and makes more available everything that is necessary for the improvement of the planet. Here we can have the source of all the uh, natural resources that we need. We can have whatever is important to take care of situations and there will be no political uh, involvements. There will be no problem of passing this regulation or trying to stop that one. If the problem is handled properly, each individual will have the means of his own protection and survival and he will feel humiliated by nothing. He will not be depending upon the generosity of anyone. He will be merely one of the six billion human beings that are the primary asset of the human race. If we can think of it a little that way, I think we'll be very much better off in the days ahead. Thanks a lot.